demonstration of Wirecast. Our scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Chronicles 29, verses 11 and 12. 1 Chronicles 29, verses this 11 and 12. Demonstration of wire Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. May God add the reading, uh, the blessing to the reading of his word. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. Okay, this morning... Uh, Brother Chris Seeley is going to bring us a message. I uh, met him last week for the first time when he was bringing his son down, who is going to be Virginia Tech graduate work. Oh, VCon. Okay. That's the medical part. What? Well, aspiring doctor. Well, we've had a lot of VCon students this come through. A demonstration and we're very Wirecast. happy to have them all. But anyway, the, from Northern Virginia, Faulkner County. Okay, um, that's just up my neighborhood. I'm from Frederick area, there for years before we moved down here. But uh, we're glad that he is with us today. His wife is here, his daughter as well. Um, we know that uh, you attend that, um, this was C, CP, CPC? Okay, church up there. Um, that's a this church that a came about after I left, so I'm not too familiar with it. Anyway, we're glad that he's here this morning, and I'm sure the Lord will bless us as we listen to Brother Chris this morning. Thank you. Good morning, and God bless you. I was about to say, I was saying to myself a few um, minutes ago that they don't know me here, no one knows me, but then in walks a good friend of ours, one of the elders from 
the Fairfax Church, and he and his family are here. So now I've got to behave myself because there's at least somebody who knows me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Teach us now, we pray. Amen. For the next few minutes, I want to uh, talk with you about the world and what's happening in the world. Uh, I think you would agree with me. I think it's a fair assessment if we say it's a, it's a crazy world we live in. Uh, it, it's so crazy, ladies and gentlemen, that this the events that happened fire. last week seem like a long time ago. It seems as if it was a long time ago that we were reading about a young man who had invited his friends, text them, and brought them to the cafeteria and then began to shoot them. That seemed like a long time ago. It seemed like a long time ago when we woke up one Sunday morning and discovered that 49 people in a, uh, a bar had been shot by someone who had been visiting. That seemed like a long time ago. It seemed like a long time ago that we read that some unfortunate incidents between a young black man and a cop had occurred and he was dead at the end of it. That seemed like a long time ago. Ladies and gentlemen, it seemed like a long time ago when we read that in Nice, France, someone had just drove a bus because last night now we are reading that some people in Germany were killed. It just seemed like the world is out of control. And so we asked, you may be tempted to ask yourself the question, who's in control? During the Sabbath school lesson, Bill talked about preaching the good news. And, 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 and I, I don't know about you, but in the workplace, people are searching for answers. Now, I don't know what side of the political spectrum you're on, if you may be thinking that something will make the world great again. But ladies and gentlemen, my Bible says that the world is not going to be great again. May I offer to you today that as terrible as the times are, listen to me this morning, as terrible as the times are, all kids would look back at 2016 and they will say those were the good old days. The world as sad as it is right now, two years from now, this will be the good old days. Because the Bible says there will come a time. See, here's why it's the good old days still. You and I could come to church today and worship and nobody is going to persecute us. There will be a time when you leave your home and you would be scared to come to church. So you'd look back on this Sabbath and say, those were the good old days. When we could have come to church and nobody persecuted us. So you look at the world today and as a Christian, trying to speak hope and truth into the world, it is difficult to explain to someone now that you're bringing good news. But ladies and gentlemen, amidst what's happening in the world today, there is good news. But I've discovered that if you really want to find out what's happening, you go back to Genesis. See, there are two questions I, we want to answer this morning. This and here's the first question. Who's in control of the world? And here's the second question. Who's in control of you? They're two very different questions. The Bible has two different answers to those two questions. Who's in control of the world? And who is in control of you? Now, to find out how this began, I'd like us to pause for a moment and go back to the book of Genesis. I don't know if you have your Bible with me. I'm not sure if this text will be able to be on the screen, but I'm going back to Genesis chapter 3 and I want to read a few things. These, what I'm about to read to you today, ladies and gentlemen, this was the good old days. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 26, then God said, let us do what? Remember that text? Let us make man in what? Our image according to our likeness. And listen to what he said. Let them, them being who? Men. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the cattle, and over the entire earth. When God created man, in the garden, perfect man, he said, let him have dominion over everything. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the good old days. And the Bible continues. So God, in verse 27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. Then God blessed them. Now look at this now. Genesis chapter 3. God did what? 
He blessed them. I don't know about you, but whenever God blesses something, good things happen. Now, before we leave Genesis, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, we would find God cursing the earth. He just got done creating it and he blessed the earth, the good old days. And he said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fulfill the earth, subdue it. Look at it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. In the good old days, man was given dominion over everything. But ladies and gentlemen, something changed. The devil, having been cast down to earth in Genesis chapter 3, we read where the devil, you know the story, I'm not going to have you read it because you know the story. He entices Eve and she entices her husband. And the end of the day, they disobeyed God. And they ate of the fruit, the forbidden fruit. Doesn't matter whether it's an apple, an orange, doesn't matter. The fruit doesn't matter. They disobeyed. And so Romans 5.12 says, Whereby as one man sin into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all the earth. And so the Bible is very clear. When man sinned, and God kicked him out of the garden, God cursed the earth. I would offer to you today, this is when a sequence of events was set in motion that are irrevocable. The reason why the cursing of the earth are yielding the results that we see today is because God is a true God. He's a God of his word. So when he curses something, that thing has to behave cursed. See, ladies and gentlemen, God cannot curse the earth. He can't curse the earth. And you I and I expect to be living in, in, in an age where there's perpetual peace, there's harmony. The temperature is always 72 degrees. There are no tones. The tree that is expected to bear fruit will always bear fruit. Our kids will calmly go to school and everything will just be good. Ladies and gentlemen, if that is your expectation, then you did not read Genesis 3 correctly. Because the Bible says he cursed the earth. Therefore, he set in place a series of events that will yield a world that's progressively worse. Now, as we continue to look at the Bible today, you'd see that it, it's going to get so bad and it has gotten so bad that even the earth itself is asking for an end to what's happening. Now, that's not a message of doom and gloom. You may say, well, Elder Celia, that's kind of a gloomy message. No, 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 no. no. Here's why it's not a gloomy message. And I'll give you an example. You know, I love to build and fly drones and so on. So a couple of weeks ago, I was building one. And wanted to try something I saw on YouTube, where they'll fly the drone and they'll catch it. So I went out the morning early and I flew the drone and caught it, and this is what happened. The prop sliced my two fingers. Pain, blood. Rushed to the patient first, and they put stitches. Now, ladies and gentlemen, painful experience. I've never seen myself bleed so much. I'm like, am I going to bleed out? So as a doctor, and I got there, I said to them, could you please give me some kind of anesthesia because I don't want to watch this. He said, no, it'd be local anesthesia. And he began, first time I've ever had stitches, four on this finger, two on this one. Pain. Have you ever lived through pain? Do you know what it is to experience personal pain, be it emotionally? Have you experienced personal pain? But now I'm watching him stitch and the needle, a small needle with what looked like dental floss. And maybe one day my son will explain to me what it was. But I'm watching him sew my flesh. And every now and again he said, it hurt? I said, eh, not too much. But you know what I kept thinking about? That sooner or later he'd be done. And I'd be able to go on. So what brought, what took me through that experience of pain was the realization that this will be over. He started teaching me at 9.30, stitching me at 9.30. I had to get into the office for a 10 o'clock meeting. So I had called my staff and said, I'll be a bit late. But all while he's stitching me, I'm, 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 this hand is free, so I'm looking at my uh, messages from them and I'm saying, you know what? At 11 o'clock, I'll be in the office and away from this painful experience. So what brought hope to me, what brought relief to me during the spirit of pain was the fact that it was going to end. 
And so the Bible is clear. What gives you and I hope in this tumultuous world that's about to get even worse is the fact that it's going to end. And there is the hope. Not, no, no, watch this. A false hope will be to assume that it'll get better. Oh, the world will not get better. Ah, oh, you hear our politicians say, make America great again. Make America whole again. Whatever side of the spectrum you fall on, ladies and gentlemen, the headlines, you're not going to wake up this is a demonstration in of December because of what you voted in November and see a headline on USA News today that says, hey, the world is great. The Dow is up. Terrorists have laid down their guns. We've never had a bountiful harvest as we're about to have. Things are great. We predict that man will no longer live to be three score and ten. We found the cure for AIDS. We found the cure for cancer. Uh, there'll be no Zika virus uh, because the world is going to be great this is again. Of is that what you're thinking? My Bible says that if you're thinking like that, let me be. Uh, I'm sad to tell you this morning, and you know I'm, I'm not too sad to tell you in some ways because I'm gone next week. I'm, so you may say, don't don't have him come again. He brought bad news. But I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. So the Bible paints a picture that the world started on a path to destruction once man sinned. And it was clear. Uh, God cursed the earth. This is a demonstration of wire cast. And now Satan has dominion over the earth because Adam relinquished his dominion. But ladies and gentlemen, while Satan has dominion over the earth, God never relinquished his ownership of the earth. Amen. See, let me help you understand. What God did with Adam and Eve, he didn't say to Adam, hey Adam, I'm signing this will now and the earth I created is yours. That's not how it went down in Genesis. What he said is, Adam and Eve... I want you to be stewards of the earth because I own it. I created it. See, he's the author of the earth, so he has authority. Author being the root of the word authority. So God has authority of the earth. But the stewardship of the world events, Adam gave that over to Satan by succumbing to Satan's wiles. Now I want to show you that the Bible is very clear. While the devil may have control over the events of the earth, he does not own it. The Bible in Psalms 24, 1 says what? The earth is the Lord's and everything it, the whole world and all who live in it. Now watch that word, the world. Because God has set an expiration date on the world, the Bible in the New Testament begins to introduce the term the world and define the world not as physical entities but defines the world as an age. So whenever you look in the New Testament, the Hebrew defines the world as a period of time because God knows he's going to end it. So in the Bible, in the New Testament, the Gospels, we find references to Satan as the God of the age. So God said, the good news is, listen, this world is going to get terrible, but I want you to know I've, I've changed the paradigm. I'm not calling it an age, a dispensation. And it has an end. And so, Daniel chapter 4, verse 17, 25, and 26 says, three times that the most high rules in the kingdom of men. Where's the kingdom of men? You live in the kingdom of men. And he says, watch this. Ah, now, you and I may vote on the 26th. Is that the date? November 26th? I think that's the date, right? You and I may vote whenever it is in November. But do you know who picks the next president of the United States? Do you know who does? Do you know who picked the current one? You think it was our vote? Do you know who put Saddam Hussein up? And when it was time for him to go, it took him down? Do you know who's allowing Sadat and uh, Assad, as bad he is in Syria, to reign? Do you know who does it? The Bible is very clear in Daniel 4. That the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he will. 
and sets over it the lowest of men. So we have this mindset. We love a good story. We love a good story in this country where someone pulls himself up by the bootstrap and he rises to power and rules. And the Bible says, hey, God sets up the next president and vice president. He's the one that's doing it. Why? Because he said there are events in the world that need to happen. Therefore, I will put in place people who facilitates the events. So the, the next pope, God is already... Look, God has already set up the next pope, the next president, the next EU uh, prime ministers, so that when he predicts, when the prophet John predicts in Revelation, that there will come a time when men will be required to bow down to the beast, God has already set the men or women and women in place who will create an environment where prophecy will be fulfilled. Because the God says, my word shall not go forth void. So, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting you don't vote. Go out and vote. But I want us to understand that irrespective of what happens in the White House, the Blue House, the Brown House, the Green House, doesn't matter where they live, that God is in control of the earth. So do not be discouraged. There's no need for you to vote. And then the next day, oh, I regret my vote. No. It really doesn't matter. God's going to set up who he wants and who he doesn't want. Look, 2 Chronicles 26 says, it affirms this. It says, O God of our fathers, art thou not God in heaven, and rulest not thou over the kingdoms of the heathen? The Bible now refers to the world as the kingdom of the heathen. Why? Because man, when we sinned, we gave stewardship of the earth, dominion of the earth over to Satan. But God never relinquished his ownership. Stewardship got passed. Ownership didn't. Aren't you glad that's the case? Because every now and again, God has to step in and put a stop to something Satan's doing. This is a demonstration of when Adam and Eve sinned, it brought a natural consequence to the earth. And the Bible says in Genesis 3, 7, And unto Adam he said, He, God said, Because thou hast hearkened, to the voice of thy wife, and has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat. Cursed. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Bill, this explains why you've got to work so hard now to get an air cone. This is a demonstration of wire cast. It explains now why you plant and weeds grow among the, the garden. And I got so frustrated over my garden that I, the weeds took over. And it seems as every time I wait for the soil to regenerate and I put manure and so on, it seems as if the weeds were getting fatter and the kale never got a chance to grow. So I said, you know what, I'm going to get weed and kale out. I got rid of the garden. Frustrated. And then reminded myself, the reason why you have weeds in your gardens, and Mrs. White said the reason why you have thorns in the rose bushes is because God cursed the earth. See, Adam and Eve touched those roses in the garden and never got pricked. But sin came and God cursed the earth. And now you have, the minute God cursed the earth, you have a situation where instead of Adam being able to speak to the lion, instead of Adam being able to say, to command the lion or the tiger, we find we have to cage the lions. And every now and again, a lion gets loose and he forgets who's in control. And he destroys the man. I don't know if you remember several years ago, there were two guys who had a show on Broadway. White Tigers, they used to have this show with White Tigers. And one of the Tigers, while just before the start of the show, gripped the man by his ear. You know there was a time when that Tiger would not even think of doing that? Do you think a Tiger was looking to grab Adam by his neck? But once Adam sinned, the world of dysfunction began to unravel. So who's in control of the world? Well, it depends on which world we're talking about. This is a if it is the world, the things outside, the system of the world, this age of the world, we know that God is in control. Now watch this. <laughs> Do you know that there was a time when the world, you say, well, Celia, I, I don't understand that. I, I, how you could say God is in control of the floods? And, and a couple few years ago, we had a bad tsunami. How could you say that God, we had a, a flood in in Texas not too long ago. How could he say that? Do you know there was a time, ladies and gentlemen, when the earth, there was no rain on the earth? Do you know, Bill, that 
that and you prayed for rain last week, I would say there was a time that the way the earth got watered is there would be Jew that came up from the soil. This is why when Noah preached, they did not believe him because Noah was preaching the flood and folk. The scientists of Noah days were saying, that doesn't make sense though, it never rains. There's dew that wets the earth. There's no, nothing ever came down from heaven to earth to rain. So there was never a flood. But the Bible tells us exactly how this thing went down because of sin. It says God was so fed up with Sodom and Gomorrah. Look what happens in, in Genesis 6, chapter 5, verse 11. Those of you who don't understand global warming, it's in the Bible. This is where it started. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 and 11. This is what the Bible says. Now the fountains of the deep were broken up. Genesis, I'm sorry, Genesis 7, 11 and 12. Genesis 7, 11 and 12. In the 600th year of Noah's life, how many years did I say? 600. And Noah wasn't walking around with a walking. Oh, I'm going to, oh, you know, I'm 600. I'm going to be 601 next year. This was not Noah. Noah was up and around. Noah was planning. Noah was, Noah was like, 600 was the new 20. We say now 50 is the new 40. Noah at 600 was in his 20s, acting in his 20s, a young man. And so the Bible said in the 600 year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, if I was very specific, on that day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up. Are you reading it? And the what were open? And it did what? And the rain. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the first recorded incidence of rainfall. Prior to this, it never rained. And so we see that sin is again ushering events in the world that are unnatural to the world. So now why do you have floods? Because now it rains. And then God had to send an assurance that I, I, you know, I, it's going to be raining from heaven from now on. And I want to show you that you won't always be flooded every time it rains. So you notice every time it rains, you see that rainbow reminding you that God is in control and he's holding. You know, if, ladies and gentlemen, if God did not stop the rain, it will rain and rain and rain and rain and rain and continue to rain. Do you know he has to step in and say, okay, enough, enough. Because nature is so out of control that it has ceased to obey its natural laws. There were laws that he set up when he created the world, and there were laws that it was never supposed to rain. Dew wet the earth. That's how he got plants. And now you have season where it rains so much, and Bill will tell you, you have season where it doesn't rain. And so God says, listen, this was great volcanic act, uh, the first recorded incidence of volcanic activity. The first recorded incidence of rain. It set the stage for earthquakes, it set the stage for tsunamis, and the stage was now set for killer storms. Because something changed in Sodom and Gomorrah that offended God so much. I want to read from you in the Bible, Romans 8, 19 and through 22, where the earth itself is so disgusted with sin that the earth itself cannot wait for God to come again. You think you're having it bad? Trust me, the earth this is, a demonstration of is not happy past. with 101 degrees. It was never that hot in the Garden of Eden. If you go back to Genesis, you will read that God said to Adam, Take care of the earth. Adam never sweat in the garden. Adam sinned, you get to Genesis chapter 3, and God says what? By the sweat of your brow. So Adam was working in the garden before sin, probably in 70 degrees temperature. Always cool. Is a demonstration Always of wire cast. Sin came in, and the temperatures got hotter. And God says, now Adam, you will sweat. And so we find in Romans 8, 19 to 22, even the very earth is saying enough of this. When there's rain, it's too much. When there's sun, it's too hot. And so the Bible records in 8, 19, for the earnest expectation of the creation. This is the creation. This is what it says. 
eagerly waits for the revealing of the Son of God. Even the earth is the earth cannot wait for God to come again. Verse 20. For the creation was subject to what? Vanity. Not willingly. The earth did not sin. But because of the sin that Adam did, God had to curse the earth. So the Paul records that the earth not willing, it was not a participant in the act of sin, but it's suffering the consequences of sin. See, that's what sin does. A lot of times people sin and they think they're having a good time, not realizing that the consequences of their action not only impact them, but it impact their entire family. Guy, girl goes out and does something crazy, and what it does, it brings dis a, a disdain, it brings a bad name on what? On the family's name. And then you ask him or her, man, why do you do that? You, you know, your family is so well respected. How many times have we seen men, public figures, not go off and do some crazy things? And then and have affairs and be bad. And then you have to watch while they put their wives next to them. And you say, boy, why? look how you embarrassed your wife. All for a few moments of pleasure. And so sin has this way of not just bringing disdain to the person who does it, but it has this way of bringing disdain to unwilling participants. And so the Bible says, For the creation was subject to the fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Verse 21. Because the creation itself also, also will be delivered. From the corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. It says the earth itself is looking for the second coming of God. So that the earth itself does not have to deal. And if you think it's bad here, you should hear what, how hot it is in India. In Heidelberg. We think we got it bad at 101 today. And, and you know... The sun will set and it'll get cool today and we'll thank the Lord. And tomorrow it probably won't be 101. But in Heidelberg and some of these uh, Asian countries where it's so dry, they live with 120 degrees every day. And so the earth itself is saying, I, I'm not, the earth itself is saying, I'm not happy seeing human beings die from heat, from heat exhaustion and then have to be buried in the earth. It seems as if the earth is saying, man, this is not the way a human being should go down. I have to accept someone into the grave who was buried because of heat exhaustion. I have to accept someone into the earth who was buried because of extreme cold temperatures in February. The earth itself is saying, man, this is not what God had planned for us. And so the earth groans. The earth itself groans when it sees mothers burying their children. Because of a kid has asthma, or suffered an asthma attack, and is now can't even uh, 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 deal with the pollen from the trees. The earth itself is saying, my, 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 oh my. The very pollen that the trees are using to be fruitful and multiply threatens human nature. You know some people have bad asthma allergies with the pollen? Some of them even die. And so the earth is saying, this is not what it was supposed to be like. The earth, in its natural course of events, was not supposed to be doing harm to humanity. And, and, and so the Bible says, verse 22, this For we know of that the world, not the people in the world, the earth groans and labors with pangs until now. Because the earth itself is saying, Lord, how long again before you come so you could end this misery and debt. And so Christ, in his loving kindness and mercy, not only has to come for you and me, but he has to come to restore the earth itself. Because what you're seeing now, 101 degrees, people will look back at today and say those were the good old days. But thanks be to God that this thing has an expiration date, a period. 
And so God says, I'm in control. And every now and again, you see the earth get out of control. And you read the situation with disciples where God got up and he says, peace, be still. I would offer to you, ladies and gentlemen, today, that if sometimes God doesn't look out over the clouds and say, hey, rain, aren't you going to stop? It will never stop raining. And so God says, listen, I'm going to come and restore the earth. But listen to this. He's got control over the earth. He can speak to the earth. And the earth still does what he says. Of Wirecast. The natural course of events have changed. Every fruit-bearing tree was supposed to bear fruit after its kind. Every seed of a fruit-bearing tree was supposed to produce another fruit. There never was supposed to be a case where a fruit fell off of a tree young and rotted and never became ripe. That's unnatural. Every fruit was supposed to ripe in its natural case on the vine and be edible. But now you find in this unnatural course of nature because of sin you find trees give up their fruit young and the fruit lay on the ground and rot and because the world is so nature has gotten so much out of control it's created incidences where we can't have enough food to feed the people in the earth so now we have people who are dying from starvation what do you think the earth does when it looks up at God and say, wow, you know, I was created to be fruitful and multiply and to give Adam food. Lord, I'm discouraged. I, the earth, am discouraged to see human beings unable to eat because I cannot provide food for them. And it's going to get worse, scientist says. There are about 7 billion people in the earth and can't even feed them now. And so scientists have to derive ways to get nature to produce food that it can no longer keep up with the population. So you have non-organic corn because we're trying to get corn to produce more corn. We're trying to create tomatoes that are impacted by the insects. The insects were never supposed to attack the tomatoes. But now we have to create a strain of tomatoes that are bug resistance so that you and I could get a tomato to eat. And God looked at this and he says, okay, I'm going to fix this. But there's something that I cannot do. See, God at any point in time could stand up and speak to the earth because he owns it. But the people in the earth, different story. God cannot nor does he stand up to you and say, peace, be still. He can't. If he did, he'll be a tyrant. God is not in control of your life unless you allow him to be that way. Why? Because he has, he created human beings with free will and he has to honor what we choose for two reasons. One, he has to honor them because he's a just God. And two, he has to honor us in our free will because he loves us. You don't say to someone you love them and then try to control their actions. That's not love in action. So we find two questions this morning. Who's in control of the earth? God is. And he says, yes, there are floods and, and, and there are tsunamis, but I would have you to understand it'd be worse than that if I were not in control. But the more important question this morning is the people, is which he said clearly, I can't, by matter of fact, Revelation puts this the way. Behold, I stand at the door and do what? Knock. Do you know when Christ was on earth, the Bible records in the Gospels, that there were places, Matthew 23, 37 through 38, I'm not going to read it. Getting ready to close this up in the next few minutes. God himself says, I could not have done miracles in Israel because the people 
didn't want me in Israel. No fate. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here's where as human beings is quite different than the earth. You would never read in the Bible where the earth, when God speaks and he says to the storm, peace be still, you would never read anywhere in the Bible where the earth tells God, you leave, please. We don't want you in charge. However, we have recorded incidences in the gospel when Jesus came into the town and he drove the demons out of the man into the animals. Who said to leave? Humans. We said, God, please leave our town. This is what God has to deal with. This is why the Bible says it hurts his heart to see the very people he creates. Sometimes by our actions, we tell God, you're not in control. Please leave. And you know when we like to get God in control? When something happens. It seems as as human beings, the only time we want God in control is when something happens that we have no control over. That's when we pray. God is in control. But in the good times, we don't want him in control. We want to choose to the college kids here. We want to choose our schools we go to. We want to choose our professors. We want to choose how we graduate. We want to choose when we graduate. But God is saying this morning, I want to be in control of your life. And here's why. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. But if you let me control your life, I will take care of you. Now listen. Matthew chapter 24. This is God speaking. This is why I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to get worse. I don't understand how any human being could live without Christ in their life. You're living a dangerous life. Matthew 24, beginning at verse 3. And he was sitting on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him and they said, Tell us when these things will happen. This is a what shall be the of sign of thy cast. coming? Next verse. And Jesus said to them, Take heed that no one deceive you. This is Jesus talking about 2016. For you will be hearing, next verse, for many will come in my name saying, I am Christ. Don't we live in an age where many people declare themselves in Utah to be Christ? And like Christ, and they have people who sell things and go because they believe these are the Christ. So he says, here, listen, many will come saying, I'm Christ. Matter of fact, he says, many will kill saying that it is of me. Doesn't ISIS behead people and say, Allah said to do it? So I'm not... You see, ladies and gentlemen, you've got to read your Bible and, and interpret the, the, the events in the context of the Bible. I'm not surprised that there are people beheading other people and said, Allah says do it, God says do it. Because Jesus himself said, many will kill and say, I'm doing it in the name of the Lord. And he continues. He says, next verse. And he shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. How many wars are the United States not fighting right now? At least three. We in Iraq. We in, uh, uh, well, these are the ones we know of. Trust me, there are many more wars the United States are fighting that ends on the news. So we know we're in Iraq, we're in Afghanistan, we're fighting the rebels in Syria. Wars, and, and it seems as if every time you turn on the news, there's a rumor of war. Matter of fact, matter of fact, here's what the world philosophy is. The world philosophy is, if you want peace, you've got to fight war. Because the way you get peace is to destroy your enemy. Isn't that weird? God must be saying, how illogical is that? For me to be at peace with you, I've got to kill you? To be at peace with your family? What kind of logic is that? But we create these wars and we justify wars. Hey, we got to go into Iraq. Got to kill the bad guys so we can have peace in the world. And we accept it. We say, you know what? Go. We say, go in peace. And we send our daughters and we send our sons to fight wars because we believe that you bring peace through wars. And God says, listen, of Wirecast. for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. I wish I could tell you 2016 is the end, but Jesus, this is Jesus speaking. Next verse. For nations shall rise against nation. Is that not true? Britain, you say, you know, listen, we don't want to be in the EU. We exit in the EU. We out. Britain's out. We on our own. Nations against nations. And then Germany said, please leave quickly. We just don't want to divorce you. We want you to divorce fast. Nations against nations. 
You're reading it in the headlines. This is a demonstration. Kingdoms, and there shall be famines. Have you not reading about famines? I just told you, we can't feed 7 billion people. And pestilences. And, and by 2020, it's estimated there'll be close to 20 billion people in the world. It delivered in diverse places. Earthquakes. Aren't you hearing about earthquakes? Tsunamis? Four nations. Next verse. And these things, ladies and gentlemen, I wish God had said this was the end of it. He says, these are the beginning of sorrows. This is a demonstration of wire cast. I'm looking at you today and you're saying, boy, that's a very dark sermon. No, it's not. It's a very truthful sermon. And here's the hope. Continue to verse 21. Keep going. Run to verse 21. I want to show you the great hope. I'm wrapping this up. You can read Matthew 24 and see. Ah. But pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath. Good. Here we are. For then shall be great what? 21. Go ahead. 21. For then shall be great what? Tribulation. Such as what not seen since the beginning of the world. The world here being this age. Nor shall ever be. Next verse. And except those days be shortened, there shall be no flesh saved. So God is saying the world is out of control. Nature is out of control. And unless I shorten those days, the things that you were to have dominion over are going to kill you. So I am going to shorten those days so that you will be saved. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the great that God is in control and he wants to be in control of our lives because he cannot do things in our lives unless we, God will never, you, see, you know, people sit back and say, why did God allow it to happen? Because you didn't give him control. That's why things happen. You did not give him control. You expect God to take control? You know, you expect, well, God, you, I, I serve you, you should just take control. That's what tyrants do. Tyrants take control when not given privilege. God said, I'm not tyrant. I, want, I stand at the door and knock. And if you let me in, I will take control of your life. And all these things that are about to happen, I will take care of you. For I was young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Pretty simple discussion this morning. It's about control. This is a when Satan sinned, the earth Went out of, when man sinned, the world went out of control. Adam, when he was kicked out of the garden, had now to make a choice. Adam and Eve had choices. They made the wrong choice at first. They chose Satan over Christ. The reason why the people in the world are as they are now, the reason why a young man We'll read some cast. propaganda at home today. Go out tomorrow and shoot people with an automatic weapon. It's because men continue to choose Satan over God. The reason why you'll go to VTech now and find more kids in the stadium than you would find them here is because men continue to choose Satan over God. And sometimes when Virginia Tech or VC or VCOM has games that fall on Saturday, your church is empty. Because more people choose the games over God. And he's saying it should be the other way around. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, he will do what? He will heal us. And so God is saying to you today, I'm still in control. I own the earth. I can shut this thing down whenever I want. The reason I've not shut it down as yet is because not everybody has been given the opportunity to choose me. So what you and I have to do, ladies and gentlemen, this is what Bill was saying in Sabbath school this morning, is to spend every waking moment trying to tell someone that God needs to be in control of his or her life. And then, before we leave here this morning, we need to put control, God in control 
Association of Wire of our lives. See, I'm going to leave. My wife and I are leaving this week. Going back this weekend. Be going back to Virginia. My son will be here. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to be very clear with you. This is a nice church. Nice people. Bill seems to be a nice elder. Corinth seems to be a nice lady. But that's not why I'm driving home comfortable. When I look at the news, this young black kid, of there's always this fear as a black parent that what if my son gets stopped by a cop in Christiansburg and when I turn on the news, I hear it's my son. But I'm not worried about that. Bill, I'm not worried. I'm leaving here, my wife and I, we driving by. You won't see me here every Sabbath. I don't have to be here every Sabbath. Why? Because we put our son in God's control. You brought your son down to start school today? Nice church. Don't be worried. When you go back to Fairfax, you sing as loud as you can. Now, every now and again, when you pay the bill at the end of the month, how great thou art. That's a different song. But don't worry, he'll be okay. Josh will be okay, your boy will be okay. The kids will be okay, not because they'll come here, but because we're leaving them in God's control. And if, he, if he's a God of his word, and I believe he will, ain't nothing will happen to Joshua cast. Bill. He'll be okay. I thank God that he's put you in his path, correct in his path, because you know what? He still works for human beings, through human beings. He's not going to just send angels. Joshua will walk in here and say, hey, who's that with you, Joshua? Five angels. Uh-uh. <laughs> he doesn't do that. Because I sh I'm sure if he walks in and you all see folk flying around him, you all be like, don't bring that boy in here. He's possessed. <laughs> but my point is, ladies and gentlemen, when you leave home in the morning, there is no guarantee you will get back home. You might be driving safely. Somebody runs into your car. Leave today, this place, with God in control of your life. Is that your prayer this morning? Let's pray. Father, it's a simple word. Who's in control of the world? Well, we learned today that the world, the things of the world, the world of the, the age of the world, that you retain ownership even after we give Satan dominion. But we thank you that you are in control of the earth because you still say to the rain, stop. You still say to the grass, grow. You still say to the trees, be fruitful and multiply. And yes, you say sometimes to the sun, cool it. Temperatures go down. But more importantly, Lord, you stand now today looking for us to welcome you into our lives so that you could control our lives. You've painted the picture in Matthew when asked what would it be like before you come. Nothing in Matthew predicts that the good old days of the Garden of Eden will return. But what you have said is that you will bring an end to this madness. And is it the hope that this madness will end which is why we are saying today, Lord, we put our lives in your hands. So that when you end the madness, we will be saved. For anyone whose life is not under your control, when you end this earth, they too will end with it, including Satan. We do not wish to be part of that end. And so today... We make an investment in our future, our heavenly future. We ask you to control the young people in this church, those who will be returning. As they come back to study sometimes, Lord, they want to study so hard they wouldn't want to come to church. We pray that you will always remind our young people to put God first. We thank you for this, Lord. We thank you for the visitors who are here as they travel, including myself, take us back safely. But we thank you for the simple assurance this morning that this madness is going to end. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Have a blessed Sabbath. This is a demonstration of Wirecast.
Our closing hymn is number 86, How Great Thou Art. Please stand with me as we sing number 86. Sings my 
Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this message of who's in control. We ask that you would allow us to have you come into our lives and watch over us. Thank you so very much. And as we partake of our food, may it bless our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated.